Oh, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure people also want to see it. So I'll turn on my camera a little bit here and I'll share my screen here in a second. So yeah, I'm really uh, uh, humbled to be able to talk to all of you today. Uh, when Joshua well, reached out to me, I, I, I wasn't actually sure what I was going to talk about or what I was going to do. Um, so I kind of came up with something brand new, um, kind of to tell a little bit of my journey and where we're at in the world of mobile development, desktop development, where it's going and sort of what Microsoft is providing. Um, and and it's, so the whole talk that I really want to give is less on mobile development. There's not demos. There's there's not like here you should use this thing. I'm going to kind of tell you what we're doing, what the opportunities are, and why I've been excited about mobile development for the last nine years. Uh, so like Joshua said, I'm a program manager lead at Microsoft and I sort of overlook all of the mobile development tools uh, across building integrations, deploying, and I work a lot with our student partners, with our partners in the field, with community members all over the place. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here and then let me know when you can see it. I'm hoping that you can see it. Let me know. I don't have a chat room, so just Joshua, you can ping yeah, in and say yes. Good. Okay, cool. Awesome. <laughs> so, so like I said, this is a very different uh, session for me. So I kind of wanted to go back to to where kind of my journey sort of began and not well, kind of in life. Um, I grew up in this beautiful, uh, in quote, I would say beautiful town of Cleveland, Ohio. It's in the um, Midwestern part of the United States. It's right on the Great Lakes. Um, it's uh, an iron town, so there's a lot of manufacturing. Um, I grew up there all my life um, before I went off to college. Uh, my dad was in iron work. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. My stepmom later on uh, was in the iron industry, so I thought I was going to be in the iron industry making things out of iron and, and hitting things with hammers. I think that pretty soon um, my dad figured out that that was not going to be my life because all I wanted to do was play with Legos and play video games. That was pretty much my entire childhood. Um, I didn't grow up very um, 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 well off. We we could buy things where we could. Um, and uh, that's why Lego sort of hit me is the thing that I could construct uh, physically and, and build. And then when I got my first original Nintendo system and I could play Mario, that's literally all I played for two years straight in my basement of our house growing up when I was five or six. And between these two things of building and playing really sparked my interest in, in what I could do beyond what my father was doing, which was constructing physical goods. How could I take the things that I loved in the, in the real world and turn them into a digital um, aspect? I was very, very lucky growing up in high school uh, that I actually had a professor, a math teacher, who also was a programmer, and he offered a C++ course in our high school. Um, and this was back um, almost 20 years ago. I'm pretty old at this point. I'm 33, so I guess I was 13 or 14. And uh, all my friends were taking the class and I was really jealous because they would come back on their cool calculators and have all these games. So I said, I want to do that. So I immediately signed up um, for the C++ class. And within a day, I, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to create video games. And that's what I did. I built amazing text command line adventures where you had these cool ASCII arts. Look, there's a smiley face representing the character on the screen and you could move in four directions and there were mountains and there was rivers and um, this is all I wanted to do. Uh, it really, really sparked my interest uh, and, and, uh, and, and I knew that this was like the career I wanted to go. I knew video games and programming were the things that I could do. So I was going to become a game programmer. Now growing in the Midwest, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. Uh, like I said, basically everything that was there was either medical or iron work. Uh, there wasn't technology. I don't even know very many software development houses that, that were in the area at all. So I decided to do one of the hardest things in my life, which was to move halfway across the United States. Uh, I moved all the way to Arizona, um, which is several thousand miles away um, from my entire family. And I went to a school called UAT. And, and at UAT, it's a, it's a game school. So um, the whole uh, premise is that if you want to have a career in video games, that you go to the school. So that's what I did. I, I moved. I said goodbye to everyone. I said goodbye to all my friends um, from high school. They were all staying locally, doing everything that 
they thought they were going to do and, and they went off and did it. Um, and, and I did my thing. I said goodbye, basically, and, and never looked back. Um, of course, I saw my family. Don't get me wrong. Besides my family, for everyone else, I said goodbye. Um, and there was really interesting. We had a, um, a forced internship. So I was creating and learning different programming languages like Java and, um, and tons of more C++ work and a bunch of other things. And we had a forced internship uh, that you had to do to graduate. So you had to go work at a game company or game adjacent company. And I got really lucky to go work uh, at, a, at another company. I was working at GameStop selling video games. So before you can make video games, I had to sell video games. Um, and someone in the industry came in and said, hey, I'm working on an Xbox 360 game. Do you want to come intern? I was like, OK, I'll go do that. And I, I did that. And, and, and during my career there, I went and I made a, a game at this company called Crunch Time, Crunch Time Games. Uh, it was called Shred Nebula, and it was a game for the Xbox 360. And uh, the whole premise of it was a top-down shooter, like you're seeing here, um, that you would fly around in space, do space battles online. There's a whole mission journey that was there. Um, and the game was did not sell very well, did not do very well, but it it, it made me learn a lot of things during development. The first thing is that is that. Oh, there we go, perfect. And there we go. Okay, cool. So you should be good to go now. So the first thing that I learned there was um, the game industry was very interesting. It's very different than I thought it was going to be. Um, it wasn't really the atmosphere I was looking for. I spent a lot of my time writing C++ code, and um, and it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but during my time there, what I found what was interesting was that I had an instructor. I was still in school, and this is my instructor, Phil Miller. Uh, he actually changed my life kind of in my trajectory of where I was going. It's kind of fascinating to look back to say there was a moment in time where one teacher decided to offer one course in my college class that really adjusted what I was going to do at the game studio, but also in my entire career trajectory. Because up to that point at the game studio, at college, I was writing Java and C++. That's all I was doing. And Phil Miller decided that he wanted to teach people object-oriented code in a different way through Microsoft technology with C Sharp. And C Sharp, to me, really blew my mind. It, it, it was this amazing language that was everything I wanted it to be. And, and what was great is that it was really great for Windows development. And that's where I was developing the game on for the Xbox. Um, all the tools, Visual Studio was there. And what happened at the game studio is that I decided at that point in time that I was going to not be a game developer, but I was going to write desktop applications to help game developers. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go off and I wanted to help build desktop applications, you know, things that I'd use every day, like Outlook and, 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 and Internet Explorer at the time and Firefox. I was going to build these great applications so I could use C Sharp everywhere. It was something, it was a language that spoke to me. It was like sort of that, that light bulb that went off in my head. I said, oh, this is it, right? I thought it was games, but it's actually not the game itself. It's building these really cool tools to help people. Um, there. So I built tools for level designers and for our graphics designers and our editors, things that would help the game be developed faster. And that's really, really what I wanted to do. So the game came out. I graduated from college. Um, like I said, the game didn't do well, so I didn't get a job there after college. So I went out on a journey and I said, I'm going to go go out there and I'm going to find a job in the game industry. But then I was living in Phoenix, um, Arizona which again was far away. There weren't very many game studios. There were a lot in California, but I interviewed, I interviewed around and I said, well, I don't really want to move. I, I just moved halfway across the, the United States. So I need to find something. And after interviewing at a few studios, I was fresh out of college. I was kind of down on my luck. I didn't have a lot of opportunity necessarily locally. I kind of changed courses again and I went and I wrote printer software. So it was a completely adjacent thing, but a company called Ose, which was later bought by a Canon, like the camera company, um, they had an office there and they had a job there for me where I could write software in C Sharp 
And it wasn't games, but it was printers. And you know what? I was out of college and I could take anything that I could get. That's all I really cared about. Um, and it was amazing. It was a really great learning opportunity for me. I know it wasn't in the game industry that I wanted to be in, um, but I thought it was okay because it was a company that wanted to pay me money to do the thing that I wanted to do, which is create desktop applications in C Sharp. And uh, to me, it was a really great learning opportunity. And it was cool because it was a larger company that that also had a training budget. So what was cool about that is that they sent us to conferences every year. So I would be able to hear people talk on topics and learn about new things. And about three years into my job at Canon, so I was like 23, 24 at the time, um, they sent me to Seattle, Washington. And it was the coolest town I had ever been in in my life. Before this, I had been to Cleveland and I'd been to Phoenix. And those were the two places I'd been in my entire life, <laughs> um, really. I mean, growing up, we did travel a little bit, but not a lot in my later years in high school or, or middle school. Um, so I went here, and we went here, and we went for a conference at the Microsoft campus. It was called PDC, which is before Build. And it was everything I could have ever hoped for in life. It was amazing. It was so cool there was just like such a big city everything and, and even looking back now it's big in quotes but it's growing but it's in no size to a lot of the cities cities that are out in the world but to me it was amazing it was lush it was green it wasn't a desert um and i wanted to move there so um i said well what do i have to do to move here and when i went to the conference they gave me my first ever smartphone they gave me a windows phone it was just launching at the time um, it blew my mind before that. I only had just a very small flip phone in my hand all through college and I could program on it. And I was like, I'm going to move here. So I did. And I moved. Oh, where did, there's the, oh, the graphic didn't work. Oh, wait, oh, there was a cool graphic here that zoomed in and did something, but it didn't do it. Anyways, I moved here. I moved somewhere down over here, actually right by the Space Needle. And I started to write apps for the phone. I, I started to write phones, uh, phone applications. And uh, I moved here and specifically, oh yeah, there I moved. I moved right there, somewhere down over there. That's where I moved. Uh, I found a job on Twitter actually, <laughs> funnily enough. Someone was hiring mobile developers. I built one mobile application in my life. The one that you just saw there is a podcasting application. And I moved, I said, I'm, I'm moving. And I found the tiniest, smallest apartment that I could afford and started my career as a mobile developer. I never thought that I was gonna be building mobile applications. But with Windows Phone, I could use C Sharp and the tools that I love to take everything that I knew from building desktop applications and create like amazing things that were sitting in my pocket. It blew my mind. And at the same time, I could also just drink a lot of coffee. And that's really, really what I wanted to do in life is build things and drink a lot of coffee. And that's basically all I ever want to do. And that's all I really want to do up until this day. So if I can have those two things in life, I'm a very happy person. So find the two things that you love and hopefully one of them is development and hopefully the other one could be coffee or it could be something else. So at this company I went to go work for, it wasn't printer software, which was, which was, which was good. Um, it was a company that did television software. And at that time, my boss gave me a challenge. My first day on my job, he said, James, we have two months until our big um, con consumer electronics show where we're showing off all this new hardware. And you need to go build four applications. You need to build a Windows Phone app, an Android app, an iOS app, and a desktop application. And he said, go. He said, you have to go do this. Now, I had never built an iOS application or an Android application in my entire life. I built Windows desktop applications and one Windows Phone application. I thought to myself, why did this company hire me? I built one thing in my life. And then I asked my manager that one time and he said, well, if you couldn't do it, we'll just fire you. And I said, well, I just moved here. I, I, you know, I was thinking in my mind, I'm freaking out. So I needed something to grasp onto. I knew that I was capable. I, I learned a lot of the things that I needed to do, but how was I gonna do this in two months? Well, luckily I knew C Sharp and there was a solution for me out in the market, um, which was Xamarin, um, which is the company I went to go work for, the company that I was acquired by Microsoft and the company that um, and the technology that let me build iOS and Android applications. So C Sharp on the one side let me build the best Windows and Windows Phone applications at the time. And with Xamarin, it sort of took C Sharp and brought it to all these platforms that enabled me to build iOS, Android, and Windows applications and share code across all of them. 
So now as a developer, I could build with one set of tools, one programming language, one application that could be built into multiple applications across all these platforms. Now, the reason I tell you this journey is because one, I never thought I'd be doing this in my entire life. I never thought I'd be speaking professionally in my entire life. I never thought I'd write, you know, uh, printer software in my entire life. I never thought I would build video games in my entire life. And I never thought I'd be where I am at today. I'm very honored and humbled to be where I'm at today. But my journey is, is crazy. And I think everyone's journey is crazy. And you get these opportunities, you just grasp onto them and you go for it. And sometimes it's great to risk it. And that's why I think mobile itself is really, really intriguing. Now, I've talked about the state of mobile a lot over the nine years that I've been doing mobile development, but it always amazes me every time I look at the statistics of the correct or the, the crazy opportunities of just what is going on in the space. If you look at just mobile itself and you look at like just sort of usage of devices, still about 50% or so, 40 to 50% of all devices are laptops or desktops. I mean, I'm presenting on, on a laptop right now. We're sort of in a resurgence. I can't leave my house. So I mostly am on my laptop all day unless I'm actually just most of the time I'm just doing that unless I'm doing something around the house. But mobile itself, just mobile phones between those markets takes up more than 50% of the entire market, which is growing constantly now this doesn't even include tablet if you include tablet those other two on the left side would shrink dramatically because that is more than 60 percent of the entire market and this really to me is what intrigued me about becoming a mobile developer is that yeah i could build desktop applications but there's an equal size market and growing and growing faster than anything in the entire world and when i talk about mobile devices you may think about the, the phone in your hand, but there's all sorts of different um, size devices that are out there to scale just a plethora of them in general. So there's just like a crazy amount of devices that we have at our fingertips that are constantly coming out and growing all the time and really giving people around the world opportunities to do things that they never thought they could. So when I think about this um, scale, it's really intriguing because we, you know, many of us have smartphones that we have in our pocket or we or we're just kind of used to. When you take a look at the number of devices around the world, it's always shocking. Actually, this year alone, just smartphones, so actual smart devices, not feature phones, will be more than 3.8 billion devices. That number is more than doubled in the last like five years, um, which is a staggering number. If you were to look at actual mobile devices, which would be smartphones and feature phones, feature phones are very, very popular. Um, that's about 5.28 billion devices. There's only like, like seven or 8 billion people in the entire world. So nearly everyone has some sort of smart device or mobile device in their pocket. Now, as we look at the opportunity going forward, the numbers get crazy. In fact, by 2023, that number just three years away will be 7.33 billion mobile devices in the entire world between feature phones and smartphones in people's pockets. And by 2025, it's predicted that 72% of all internet users will only use a smartphone just five years away. And this is true because around the world, smartphones are obviously getting cheaper. Um, they're becoming more readily available. Internet's becoming more readily available in the world. Um, and there's still a huge opportunity that are being rolled out across the company, uh, across different companies and different telecoms and different device manufacturers. And as we think about the types of applications we can create, we can think about just how we use our devices, how we pay for things, how we get money in and out um, of, the, of the bank or not the bank, right? And, and how we send money or how we talk to people is completely changed. Now, the adoption of devices, too, is really staggering. Um, one statistic that we sort of look at is, is is sort of a benchmark of, okay, well, sure, mobile devices are everywhere and they're developing really fast, but what is the adoption of of anything and, and, and the long-term usage of it? Well, uh, statistics people always use is, well, the first to 50 million. So if you can get to 50 million, that's a really great number. So if you look at te popular technologies and how long they took to get to 50 million users, it's actually dramatic. Um, of how fast the iPhone got there. So the telephone took 75 years, the radio 38 years, television 13, the internet five years, the iPhone just three. And when Angry Birds came out just a long time ago now, 
it just took 35 days for Angry Birds to reach 50 million users. And in fact, it no longer takes 35 days for applications to hit 50 million users. When Mario Kart Tour came out, I believe that there was more than 50 million users a day one that are ready to use these applications. There's just a staggering amount of people around the world that are using their devices every single day. Because it's part of who we are at our core and how technology is helping us. And we use our devices a crazy amount. In fact, on average, we use almost three hours a day just our phone on it. If we look at phones and tablets, it's more than 261 minutes every single day combined that we are on these devices. And if we look at just top five media applications that are out there for social media, those applications are used on average 76 minutes a day. So not only are people buying devices, using devices, but they are on them a lot and using applications a lot. And it's also intriguing too, because people are using them a lot too, but they're using them in crazy ways that we would never thought think of. Because yeah, sure, they're on their device a lot of time, but during that times that they're throughout the day, they have 63 interactions. So that means they reach for their phone over 63 times a day. That's over three times an hour on average. 88% of people in the world actually use their device while watching TV. And surprisingly, 75% 75 of people use it when they're in the bathroom. So we're using it and we're using our devices all the time everywhere where we're at, no matter what. So it's really fascinating to look at the adoption and the usage of everything. And in fact, here in the United States, we have our Supreme Court. In our Supreme Court, they sort of give the final, final ruling on things. And there was a case that was about unlocking people's devices. So specifically, how can you unlock people's devices when you're pulled over, things like that. And they ruled against it. In fact, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, um, he said that modern cell phones are now such a pervasive and insistent part of our daily life that a proverbial visitor from Mars might conclude that they were an important feature of human anatomy. And what he's saying there is that our phone is basically a part of us. That the distinguishing part of what is inside our applications on our phones and our identity and everything that we have are really at some point part of us. And at the same time, as cell phones become more part of our daily lives and become of who we are, they also transform applications, businesses, um, that would never before exist without cell phone technology or um, have to transform because of cell phone technology. And in fact, in these times now, especially here in the United States and around the world, we're seeing all sorts of new applications and usage for information um, to help people get essential services and food and everything that they need around the globe. And I think why I like talking about the adoption of mobile applications and mobile devices is to see all the companies that have come out over this that could have never existed before. Uber, Grab, Lyft, the series of all the different pickup food services that exist, those things would never exist or existed in an old fashioned way, right? You had to call someone on the phone to get picked up at this address and maybe they would find you, maybe they wouldn't. To be able to go into your device, tap a few buttons and have someone drop off food or pick you up is just something that couldn't possibly have existed when I was growing up. And as we sort of look going forward, we take a look at every single business that's humanly out there. And more and more, they're all becoming software companies. They're looking to engage deeper with their customers every single day. They're looking to get breakthrough technologies and products out for every single person across the globe. And at the same time, companies that are becoming software companies are looking to become more efficient, right? Everything is moving faster. When Angry Birds hit 50 million users in 35 days and Mario Kart hit it in one day, you need to be more efficient. You need to roll out updates faster than ever. You need to have your development cycle faster than ever. You need to be on the latest and greatest devices that are out there to really wow your users. And that means that there's a lot of challenges for companies too. There's more devices than ever. There's hundreds of hundreds of devices being launched every year. And that's just in the mobile space. 
when I think of mobile, I think of more than just mobile devices. I think about all these great, cool emerging technologies. So smart watches, televisions, um, wearables, uh, smart speakers, IOT devices, all of these things are really mobile devices, just in different form factors. And as a developer, as a company, they want to be able to target every single one of them. Now, as these devices become more prevalent, as there's new and new technologies, the third part here is what becomes really important and important for not only companies, but also for developers to be able to harness the sort of technical um, ability, which is in data and intelligence. And what I mean by that is that these companies go global. They're not just in a small pocket of a small city or um, a country or a town or a continent. Uh, they're on a global scale, which means their data has to go everywhere and follow their users everywhere. If I have Uber or Lyft or Grab installed on my device, when I go to um, um, the uh, New Zealand or if I go to Asia or if I go to Africa, I need to be able to use my applications everywhere that I'm at and the ne data needs to be fast and flow through. At the same time, you can also infuse those applications with smart things like making sure I don't log in over and over again, doing authentication to ensure that with my face, I am who I am. Um, Uber, for instance, um, when a driver gets in their car, they do a facial recognition scan to ensure that that driver is who they are to add extra protection layers onto them. So you, these new data and intelligence services can increase the potential for a company, but also as a developer, we have more things to learn. So I think when it comes to mobile success across these devices, it's really important to think about, well, how am I going to be successful? What are the opportunities that I can go and start building today? So you know the opportunity, the amount of devices, the companies that can transform, the companies that are looking to transform, which is every company. But you, as someone that's looking to get into mobile, or maybe just starting your career in learning a programming language, you want to be able to do a few things, those things that I just showed you. You want to be able to build beautiful applications. You want to be able to get those applications to your users quick and learn and then connect them to some sort of cloud service so you can get those cool services like I was talking about. Now, at Microsoft, we think that we have everything that, that developers need to target those devices. And in fact, when we talk about just building mobile applications we never talk about just building mobile applications because rarely that is what you want to do rarely you need a website you need a desktop application you need something running on your server you might have a, a game aspect to it you may have some ai aspect to it and what microsoft has something called .NET, and .NET is our platform to enable developers to build for absolutely any single platform in the world that we can get .NET onto so when I say any platform, I mean Mac, Linux, Windows, iOS, Android, TVs, watches, smartphones, um, smart little Raspberry Pi devices, Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, uh, anything that we can possibly put um, .NET on, we can run it on. .NET runs on train systems. It runs um, anywhere, basically, it can possibly go. It's this unified platform to help developers build for anything, but also focus on one thing. So if you want to just build mobile applications, you can. If you want to build just desktop applications, you can. We'll help you be successful there. And the great part about .NET is that it's a unified platform. So all of these different devices and operating systems, they each have their own unique platform code. So specific user interface or APIs for iOS, Android or Mac or Windows. But the bulk of that logic can be shared, that big bottom part here that you see in purple. So as a developer, when I'm calling some server or I'm writing some logic in my application to do something, I write it once. Now I might only run that in a mobile application, but maybe later I need a website. Maybe later I need a desktop application. Well, you can use the same libraries, the same ecosystem, and that same code between all of the .NET platforms. And you get to use great tools like Visual Studio, Visual Studio for Mac, VS Code, or even the command line. And everything's free. There's community editions. You don't have to pay us for anything, which I think is absolutely awesome. Um, and then you can just start building and shipping applications. 
And um, .NET's been around for a long, long time. Um, I've been a .NET developer since I was in college. When I when Phil Miller showed me C Sharp, I was building on .NET. And from the early parts of only being a Windows platform to where it is today, there's been a really um, um, a huge growth from the entire community. So when you look at this, um, this chart, I'll just sort of point out some of the things that are happening in this ecosystem um, for .NET and around mobile development too, is one, just last year alone, there were a million brand new .NET developers. And before that, the year before that, there was a million more as well using Visual Studio. It's the most loved framework on Stack Overflow. C Sharp itself is one of the top five languages on GitHub. Um, when we're running .NET on the server, it is seven times faster than writing it in JavaScript with Node.js. We're all open source, every part of it. We're one of the top 30 um, open source projects between um, .NET and our web technology, ASP.NET. And in fact, the opportunity is now because 40% of individuals that we survey are students coming up, starting into .NET and building applications for anything. Now, of course, I love mobile, and I think that's one thing that I've always fallen in love with. The moment I got my hands on a mobile device, that's all I wanted to do, and I've been doing it for nine years. And inside of the mobile space here, that's where Xamarin lives. And Xamarin is our mobile technology and cross-platform technology, too. And what I've loved about Xamarin is that I could, in the past, have to write this application multiple times in Objective-C, Swift, or Java. But what Xamarin enables me to do, and you to do, is to create beautiful native applications across any platform using C Sharp. Get access to the native APIs, get access to the native user interface, and access to all of the native performance of these devices. So you can build anything you want. Now there's a few aspects of this that are very important. One is that when you build these applications, you can build one or you can build many. So you can build just an iOS application, just an Android application, or you can build any other .NET application too on top of it. So that could be a Windows application, a Mac application, a website. And what's cool about Xamarin is these sort of head projects, iOS, Android, and anything else enable you to access those native APIs, native features and technology, but share a huge amount of the application logic and you can optionally share user interface and access native APIs and access that native performance. So most of our developers, instead of sharing no code, they share 70 or 80 or sometimes 99% of their code across every single platform using Xamarin and .NET. Now there's two really cool pieces of technology that I'm gonna talk about here because Xamarin at its core is just to write iOS and Android apps. And .NET enables us to share our business logic across these different applications, but accessing native features and native UI is really important. So when it comes to mobile, when you think about the things that you do on your mobile devices, well, we're interacting with the hardware, but we're also interacting with really awesome, unique platform features. We're logging in with our face or our thumb. We're accessing permissions or machine learning or cameras or chat messages. Um, or sharing different things and getting all these different informations of music services or push notifications or the file system. Now, each of these different platforms have access to these things. And what Xamarin does is it gives you access to these in, in C Sharp, so you don't have to go and write different programming languages for iOS or Android. But there's different APIs. So what the team did is we said, hey, there's all these great native features. Let's sort of give a common API for developers. So part of Xamarin is also something that we call Xamarin Essentials. And Xamarin Essentials gives developers access to over 60 native APIs for iOS, Android, macOS, tvOS, watchOS, Android, Windows, and all these different platforms to do things that you would normally do. So now as a developer, you can share a bunch of code and you can access geolocation, um, you can access the file system, connectivity, text-to-speech, um, sensors on your device from a single API. You don't have to go learn it three times, you learn it once, and it still is accessing native capabilities. So really what this architecture looks a little bit like is a little bit like this. You have a little Xamarin Essentials in there. Now also in here, you can write your user interface multiple times. You have full access to iOS and full access to Android. 
But what we love is cross-platform things. We're a big fan because you want to be on all the platforms. That's always the goal. So we have something that we call Xamarin Forms. And Xamarin Forms is very similar to Xamarin Essentials, in fact. Xamarin Essentials gives you access to the native APIs, where Xamarin Forms gives you access to the native user interface controls from a single API. So things like a refresh view, a checkbox, a map, an editor, a button, a label, an image, things that are common across these different platforms. Now, what's cool is that when you create these, they still look and feel like a iOS and Android application. You can theme them to be whatever you like, but your users are still gonna get those native APIs across each of those devices, which I think is really unique in what is users are looking for. So what this means is that really, there's all of this cool technology that developers have access to inside of Visual Studio. There we go. Cool. Thank you. Um, access to everything. And in fact, with Xamarin and .NET, there's companies all over the world building applications with this technology. So all sorts of different companies from Microsoft to to American Cancer Society, to um, Coca-Cola, to UPS, to British Airways. So some of these uh, companies might look very familiar. Some some may not. Some like uh, the Dutch tax office, they're like the entire tax office all just runs on Xamarin technology. And all sorts of companies, hundreds of thousands of companies and developers around the world are using Xamarin to build their mobile applications. And when I say build really beautiful things, I really mean it. So of course these companies are big companies and things like that, but let me show you some applications that actually just developers in the community, our community members, our MVPs, our student partners are building. So when we think about building applications, we think of modern, performant, native user interfaces. So these are just some of the applications that our developers have built. They're all open source out there. Um, the first one on the left is like an art application to show different artwork from different artists. This one is cruise ship application, so you can book cruise tours um, across the globe. The one in the um, next to it is food service, being able to get food services across the globe. And the other one is a vacation holiday um, one as well. So you can go off, book different holidays, contract. And you get this beautiful native UI that looks exactly the same across iOS, Android. You can theme it exactly the same for your users. Beautiful animations, transitions, truly anything that you want that can really be shared across the different platforms. And while I think, you know, building beautiful things is, is really great, and I think things that are pretty look pretty, and I want to use the pretty things, I think it's also important to kind of think about well, what else can we build that can really transform lives in a way. And we have a team here at Microsoft um, called our Seeing AI team. They use Xamarin and Azure and our um, AI and, and intelligence stack to build an application for individuals that are visually impaired. And what that does is it helps people around the world from their iPhone and, and soon their Android device take out their phone and start to see the world around them. We have about a two minute video. I hope it comes through. I'll also put these slides and I'll send them to Joshua so he can um, send them out to everybody afterwards so you can watch the video locally too. But I'm just gonna go ahead and play it here and hopefully it plays back. Joshua's uh, video seemed to play back pretty good. So we'll see here how it goes. AI is a Microsoft is research project for people with visual impairments. The app yes. narrates the world cool. around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope, Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box, or a room entrance, Conference 2005, or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, Use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. K 
Campbell's Tomato Soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heat in microwave full on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close-up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. So I think to me, it's always sort of intriguing to see where we're at in the world. Does technology become more prevalent than ever? The ability for us as developers, as students, as indie developers, as enterprises to build these applications and how that work can really impact the world around us every single day. And there's amazing stories of seeing AI. I always tear up when I watch the video because I, I know the team behind it, they're really close to me. Um, and it's just really, really awesome. Now we, of course, like I said, have everything for free available. Whether you want to build a Xamarin application, you can go to xamarin.com. It'll take you to the .NET website. You can download the tools, get everything you need, um, possibly anything that you want. Um, I think that it's an amazing time to be alive, to be in the mobile space, to be a developer, to do anything that you want. Well, I did give a talk here on sort of my journey and also mobile development journey itself. My real call to action is find what calls to you. Like I was a Lego and video game kid and that's what I wanted to do. So I went off and did it and it brought me on this crazy adventure to where I am today. If you have a passion, whether it's in something I showed you today or something not, maybe you're really interested in web or desktop, there's opportunities everywhere to be a developer and to be wherever you want to do. I love mobile. It's changing every single year. It's fun. It's fascinating to see the updates come out and what we can unlock in our potential. But that's it. You can always reach out to me anytime on Twitter or just email me directly. That's what uh, Josh did. Um, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, James, for that amazing session. So we're going to open up for questions. If anyone has a question, and now is the time. So you can drop them on the chat area, or you can just unmute your mic and ask a question. Uh, this is Chetan from India. Hey, yeah. Chetan, how's it going? Oh, man, it's pretty good. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, since the cross-platform mobile applications, uh, this word has created a buzz around the mobile developers. Ever since the, uh, this era has risen, uh, all I've heard about cross-mobile development is about Flutter and about React. So um, how can you describe Xamarin usage or its competition against the Flutter and React or any other that is more popular nowadays? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So yeah, in the mobile space, you know, when I started with mobile development, um, nine years ago, I looked at a lot of different technologies before I found Xamarin. So I looked at some C++ layers. I looked at Cordova at the time, Accelerator, a lot that were out there. And to me, what struck me about Xamarin and .NET is that I was a C-sharp developer, that I was using the world's best tools with Visual Studio, the things that I loved. Um, Xamarin and, and, well, .NET has been around for 15, 20 years at this point, very stable, very long, very active development. C Sharp is growing as a language. Xamarin itself is a core part of .NET. So the long term of Xamarin itself is that it's it's at a core foundation of Microsoft and the .NET team. And we have rapid growth, like I sort of showed on that slide, of not only .NET developers, but Xamarin developers. Um, mobile development itself, the aspect of it grows at about 14% every or 12% every year across all mobile technology. So the amount of mobile developers growing and Xamarin grows faster than that at about 14 to 15% rapidly growing. So we actually are have more rapid adoption of Xamarin developers than the industry straight up. Now, when it comes to other technologies like React Native and Flutter, and there's other ones out there, obviously that do cross-platform development. What I think is really different about, about Xamarin and .NET is sort of that cross-platform aspect of it to take your code anywhere. If you're a web developer, you know, it makes a lot of sense to 
maybe take a look at React or React Native because you're a web developer and there are web things. We are actually looking at uh, enabling web developers to do more mobile development with something called Blazor, which is um, our cross-platform web stack, um, which is really unique. So if you're a web developer, you'll be able to build desktop apps, web applications, and mobile applications. And Blazor will sit on top of Xamarin. So Xamarin will power it, which is powered by .NET, which is really cool. Um, we're doing experiments and things like that in the market. Um, React and React Native obviously has a lot of growth, um, and there's sort of two different use cases for that. Uh, React Native um, can be used for an entire application or like a portion of an app, and that's often what we see is developers have an existing Objective-C or Java app, and they want to put just a little bit of React Native in there. And in fact, you see Microsoft invest in React Native too because we want web developers to build for Windows. So we enabled React Native to go to Windows. And we're not telling people like, hey, everyone should go learn React Native. If you're a React Native developer today already, then hey, you can now build you know, uh, Windows applications. And some of the teams use React Native for that. There's tons of teams here at Microsoft that use Xamarin, that use other technologies because it's whatever the skill set is of the team. When it comes to um, like Flutter 2, Flutter is a newer technology from Google, which is their own scheme. Um, they have a big push on that. I think that um, Flutter is super unique and interesting. But I guess for me, I look at Xamarin, I look at the ecosystem, the community around it that's been developed over the last 10 years. You have 10 years of knowledge. You have 10 years of um, third-party component vendors, of community members creating packages, of stability improvements, of development. Um, we have hot reload built in, so you write code, you hit save, it updates on your device for your user interface. We have new technology to debug iOS applications right from your Windows machine, right to your iPhone, or you can connect over to your Mac if you want to and get a full simulator and environment set up there. Um, I sort of always look at the space, this is a long question, because I, I do get asked a lot, is what does it look like when I'm going to go build an application? Well, yes, the underlying technology is important. And is it stable? Has it been around for a while? Is there long-term support? All of those things are true with Xamarin. But I look at the ecosystem. What does it look to be my DevOps cycle? How am I going to release it? What is the analytic software? How am I going to get updates? How am I going to update the, the app size? Does it use the latest technologies? How long does it take for a new um version of ios or android to be supported and ours are nearly same day in all aspects um and i think the biggest advantage of xamarin that's always brought me is that i don't have to go write objective c or java or other programming languages like you'd have to in in those other programming languages to bridge over we give you all of that availability in c sharp so if you need that escape hatch your escape hatch is c sharp so you get access to everything in one programming language now all that being said I don't use whatever's best for you. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you exactly what to use. I think I love what I love, but that may not be what you love, right? Every developer, every person, every business case is different um, that they come into. And that's been what I've told people for the last six years since I joined Xamarin until now. If you're a web company and you think that the web technology stack is the best for you because that's going to be more productive for you, that sounds great. I think my our tools are amazing and we hope that you use them. But... I think any good product manager, evangelist, or champion, or or student partner, or MVP would tell you the same, is hopefully you'd use what's best for you and your company. And hopefully on our side, we're building the best tool and you pick us. Thanks, Mayor, for the answer. One last question. Uh, what according to you is currently Xamarin lacks in? Or let me put it another way. Uh, what are the fields that Xamarin needs to cope up with? There are things left that Xamarin needs to cope up with. Hmm. Yeah, I always kind of get the flip side, which is, um, which is like, why wouldn't you pick Xamarin to do your stuff? That's usually what a lot of people ask me, or like in that aspect. Um, I mean, it's really hard because I think that the team has like really crushed it over the years. I mean, the applications that you saw on a few slides back, we're all built with just what's in the box and things today that the community is building you have available to you. Um, in our most recent releases, like our tooling is tightened up, our IntelliSense, a lot of the things that we've done, 
across the board. I'll always tell the team more cross-platform APIs and more cross-platform UI all, all the time. Give me more controls. Um, and they're adding more and more all the time in every release. Um, I think that, um, you know, for us, the big advantage is being able to, you know, go and, and create a watch application or create a Mac application if you want to. You don't have to, you don't have to do it all cross-platform. You can just go do that and share code across all of it. Um, I think the one thing that the, that you're going to see is probably our um, story across all of .NET of just standardization. That's really going to happen this fall with .NET 5 is a big unification of everything. Um, beyond that, I think that the one thing that every, I would say every cross-platform technology can always do better at. So whether it's Xamarin or whether it's any other one out there is, is sort of that bridge glue. So let's say you need to go use some third party library that is not a react native or a flutter or a xamarin package it's just a java or an ios library bringing that in can be more automagical that's sort of always been sort of the the weak spot there will always be there will always be more native language developers than any of the other ones always this just always will be right there's always going to be more java or swift developers than React Native or Flutter or Xamarin developers just in the world there just are. Um, because that's the platform that Google and Apple lead with, just like you know, desktop applications are primarily C sharp applications on Windows. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so so bridging the gap there is one of the the hardest parts for cross platform technology. And I think the the tooling can help a lot with that. So when you find a library, like I want to go use that, that that's sometimes the hardest part. But our goal is to make it so you don't have to do that. So <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, man. Love your session. Love to interact you more. Cheers, Nick. Cool. Thank you. All right. Any other question? I have a question. The, the tooling support that you provide for Visual Studio, do you still do the same for Xamarin Studio? The app is for tooling. And what was that one more time? The tooling support, the updates that you provide for Visual Studio, do you do the same for Xamarin Studio? Oh, good question. So, um, yeah, so before we were acquired by Microsoft, um, so, you know, Xamarin was a standalone company and a product, and then we were acquired by Microsoft. So we used to have um, Xamarin Studio, which used to be our standalone IDE on the Mac, um, and there was a Windows version. But we've um, gotten rid of those completely, and now you just use Visual Studio or Visual Studio on a Mac. So the same tooling is there. Um, uh, so sort of Visual Studio for Mac is an evolution um, of Xamarin Studio and has been evolved many, many, many times over. It's, it's much, much better than it's ever been in its entire, entire existence. So yeah, you just use Visual Studio everywhere. It's the same free model. So yeah, there's no more Xamarin Studio at all. And probably okay. if you search around, since Xamarin's been around for so long, you'll still see references to Xamarin Studio, but it's all Visual Studio. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's all free, so you can get the community edition, so you don't have to pay us anything. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello? Hello, Jack. Hi, Jack. We can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, for me, I, it's not a question, but I just want to thank James for the work he did in Xamarin. I've been learning the technology lately, and really the content you put on Xamarin show and reading your blog helps in many situations. So for me, it's just a great a message of gratitude. Thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, well, 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 you're welcome, and then thank you for for reading and thanks for watching and, and thanks for being part of the community. So without you, uh, I wouldn't be here. So I appreciate it. Hey. Go for it, Dan. Thank, thank you, James, for this call. I really love it. But I have, a, I have a question. So I want to know in which situation I have to choose to work with or to build a Xamarin native mobile application or a cross, a cross mobile application using Xamarin Forms? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it really is going to depend on your the application itself. Um, I so really, you're you're always building a Xamarin application. You're just really deciding: Am I going to build and use cross-platform user interface or not? Um, I always think it's good to learn the native stuff first, like take a few weeks or take a week to go learn a little bit about iOS and a little bit of Android, because at some point you may have to dip into that, the native stuff anyways, very similar to any other technology. Like no matter what, no matter how cross-platform something is, you're always going to have to go down into those bits and figure out the iOS and Android stuff. So I always like to to say like go take a look at that stuff and then like try to build a very simple one page application like a calculator and like I'm going to build it with iOS UI I'm going to go build it with Android UI I'm going to build it with Xamarin Forms UI right um, for me though I mean personally I just I build everything with Xamarin Forms now I'm I'm all in on it um, I I've built without it for many years uh, as well and I've always enjoyed sort of the architecture of Xamarin Forms and how it works and the community and the packages and the UI libraries around it. Um, the only real the sticking point is um, like if you're very, very um, worried about like application size and startup performance, like uh, Xamarin Forms has gotten really, really good and there's a lot of technologies to make your application smaller and faster. But there are some parts of the world where um, and some companies that are, need their application to be extremely small, as small as possible, and they need it to start up extremely fast. And in that route, if that's your case, like I need it to be under X size and I need it to start up in under X one second, you may want to look at not a cross-platform technology, such as the Xamarin Forms or any other cross-platform technology, but just go to the straight platform. So that would either be in Java or in C-sharp with Xamarin. You can just do just a Xamarin Android application or just a Xamarin iOS application. The nice thing is that you can definitely start with Xamarin Forms, see how it goes, see how far it is. And um, in that case, like all of your business logic, I would say, or a lot of the code can still be reused even if you don't use the UI later. But but also remember that you can blend, so you can you can basically combine native, you know, non Xamarin Forms UI and Xamarin Forms UI together. So you can cross them over. So I always like to think of it's not an 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 or, it's an and. So you can use as much or as little as you want inside your apps. But it just really depends on your application. But truly, like you saw earlier from the slides, the 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 apps that people were building are, are stunning and beautiful always with, with Xamarin Forms, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an hey, indirect answer, I would say. Awesome. It's not like a, a hard yes or this is the path or this, but um, that's like kind of the best I can do. But like I said, I start every app with Xamarin Forms, so um, it's kind of my go. Yeah, hey. Hey, Hertzie. Uh, I I really like your presentation, but I want to know then which uh, the new version of the Xamarin form. Why do you like on fair two? Why do I like what? One more time. Uh, the fair two fun functionality. Uh, can you can you say the question one more time? Sorry, it was breaking up a little bit. Then I I say that. The new, ver from the new version of the Xamarin form. Why do you like on the functionality? Like what functionality do I like in it? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, oh my goodness, there's so much to like. Um, yeah, I think that the team has been doing amazing things. There's sort of the the what's in the box. Like it, well, here's what's in Xamarin forms, and then there's the tooling around it. So to me. What I really like about Xamarin Forms is like the hot reload aspect of it. So I write my user interface, I hit save in my application and it updates in real time as I'm typing it, which is really cool. The latest versions of Xamarin Forms have all sorts of new controls. So there's carousel view, so you can swipe through carousels. There's media playback controls for audio and video. There's these swipe controls, so you, you know have a list of of emails and you can swipe left, swipe right on them. There's you know, radio buttons and check boxes and tons of customizations. 
every new release, I guess what excites me is just new controls and new things that I can add to my application. And, and even outside of like the release of Xamarin forms, every time there's a new version, I get excited at like what the community is, is building, um, with it. So I always get excited to see, you know, what sort of like third party packages, um, cool community members are, are building and I can use in my app. So I'm, I'm always excited for the new fancy, cool UI, I guess, cause that's what Xamarin forms all about. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I have one final question, and that is, um, does Xamarin offer the online offline um, data synchronization, especially when you have maybe like a SQL database or any other database uh, remotely? And how does that, how, what, how does the implementation go? Yeah, it's a great question. So the team ourselves, we don't offer any package like that. Um, Microsoft does have a lot of different packages out there, um, mostly around using like SQLite locally. Um, we used to have some other products that are still available open source, like Azure mobile apps. Like if you're using Azure to do that, um, that one's sort of being uh, phased away at some point. So I probably wouldn't recommend it. Most likely now what I recommend is sort of um, developers build like a web REST API and then save that data locally in a, in a database system. So there's um, SQLite or FileDB. There's some local ones that you can use um, and then sort of manage the synchronization yourself. So um, that solution, there's been a few over the years and there's been a lot of third party products that have come and gone. So it's something that we're actively investigating to hopefully have something a little bit more turnkey but right now we have you know for developers um, all the Xamarin essentials Xamarin forms on the Azure side we have authentication with Azure AD um, um, and and the Microsoft authentication library where you can do Twitter login stuff like that and then we also have push notifications um, the data part is always tricky you can totally write it yourself um, in general um, to save it offline. Um, the synchronization part is something that we're looking at, like what can we do next? Because applications have sort of fundamentally changed and so is the backend. So even some of the technologies that we created aren't really applicable anymore in 2020 or 2021 going forward. So hopefully next time you ask me that question, I have a, a better answer for you. But um, um, from Microsoft, like I said, there are a few solutions like Azure mobile apps that are open source that you can use. But, um, you know, it depends on your application and mostly a lot of developers just sort of save it locally in a local database and things like that. So I wish I had a better answer for you, Josh. Okay. Cool. Thank you, James. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for, for attending, hanging out. I know it's a late um, uh, over there, but I really appreciate it. And, and thank you, Josh, for putting this together. Thank you so much. Welcome. And uh, I look forward to doing now more more hands-on sessions, more technical sessions in the future. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Cheers. Have a good one. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining. See you next week for another session. It was awesome. <laughs>